think about the value of a mother plant. Now, not just that plant, but everything that will come from that plant. Like how many clones do you cut total from that mother plant? And then how many pounds of flour does that end up making you? You know, if it's $10,000, then think, okay, would I pay $25 to ensure $10,000? What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields. It's with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we got a very special guest, Dr. Tasa Sali, Chief Scientific Officer at Tumi Genomics. Dr. Sali, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you guys. We're excited to talk about a bunch of topics today. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. Really excited to talk to Tasa. Really excited to talk about science. And, you know, I'm even more Grateful that it's another West Coaster we have on the pod today. How are you doing, Brian? Yes, I'm excited. Kellen, you're right. Uh, We have to clarify, if you had to put yourself on the record, Dr. Silly, where would you put yourself? Oh, sorry. Are you guys... East East Coast, West Coast battle. If you had to put yourself on the record. I didn't want to give you too much setup because I knew this answer wasn't going to be... I just just wanted to get it past it as quickly as possible. East Coast, West Coast battle, where would you put us? Yeah, I guess... uh, Wow, can I just go agnostic? Can I yeah. not vote? <laughs> I love it. You well, can not the, vote. Let the record reflect, <laughs> Kellen. You almost had one, but we're going to put this I one try. as well. Yeah, try. For sure, for sure, for sure. So I think before we dive in, I think it'd be great to give a little background about yourself and kind of Tumi Genomics as a whole. Yes, absolutely. So um, as you mentioned, I'm the chief science officer at Tumi Genomics. So I was actually born and raised in Colorado. So um, I'm a country girl, I guess. <laughs> and I did all of my education here in Colorado. So all of my education is in biology, specifically molecular biology, and even more specifically in what we call RNA biology. So that's a molecule kind of similar to DNA that carries information. And that's also the molecule that carries information for hot plate and thyroid. And so it's very on point for that specific disease. And so in my graduate work and postdoc, I studied RNA and specifically how the three-dimensional shape of RNA can control actions in the cell. And that's oddly enough also exactly how um, hoplite and biroid enacts, or at least part of how it enacts its biology inside a plant cell. And so it's actually for me, even though, you know, it's, it's a devastating and horrible disease for the cannabis industry, it's also scientifically incredibly fascinating. And so I really enjoy working on it because I think it's really, really interesting. How long have you been working with viruses? So I've been working with structured RNA long time. Like with I, that's where I started at the beginning of graduate school. Um, so we moved specifically into viruses around, well, right around COVID, I guess. Um, so 2019. And we actually started working or running the COVID surveillance lab at CU Boulder. So we did that for about a year and a half. And that's where I really, our, our company really cut our teeth on, you know, in vitro assays, understanding viral biology, high throughput diagnostics, and kind of how to validate tests and how to, to understand if they're working or not. So it's been yeah about four years with uh, with virus thyroid biology. So hoplite and viroid, I'd love for you to give our listeners kind of like a high level overview of what it is, maybe in layman terms, and then from an economic impact or like a grand scale, how how prevalent is this virus and how much is it affecting cannabis today? Yes, absolutely. So hoplite and viroid and all viroids are some really weird, unique organisms, I guess, if we can even call it an organism. So most organisms on the planet have two components. If you can break it down into something incredibly simple, they have information inside of them in the form of like DNA or sometimes RNA that tells that organism how to do it, how to be whatever. And then they have kind of an outside coat and some more complex biology that protects that information and helps to interpret it. So viroids are unique in the sense that they're like, I don't need any of that extra bullshit. I'm just the information and that's it. So it's a free floating piece of genetic information and nothing else. So it's a lot more like if you were to leave your you know, DNA behind the crime scene, it's much more similar to that than it is to thinking about like a bacteria or a living thing. So because of that, it 
enacts everything that it does by hijacking the biology of the plant and forcing the plant to replicate the viroid instead of doing what all of these molecules are supposed to be doing. Um, and that entire process can be incredibly devastating to the plant. Um, and over time, you can end up with stunting and, and you know, funky growth. Um, and probably the worst and most economically impactful symptom is that it really tanks the quality of the flower. Um, you see dramatically reduced THC content, reduced yield, reduced um, terps, everything just kind of like duds out. And that's why they call it the dudding disease. And unfortunately, because... So because cannabis was, you know, kind of in legal limbo for so long and everybody was kind of growing underground and trading clones underground and this disease sort of silently passed into the cannabis industry. And then um, just because of the culture and the legal landscape, it, it kind of spread throughout the entire industry without anybody being aware that this was happening. And so when it was finally discovered to be in cannabis in like 2018, 2019, unfortunately it had spread pretty much worldwide. So at this point, uh, we've detected hoplite and viroid in cannabis in pretty much every continent in the world. So it's in the United States, Canada, Africa, Asia, just everywhere. And it's in about 80% of the facilities that test with us. So um, if you don't have an issue with hop latent viroid, you're the unique one. It's it's pretty much just something that's happening to everybody. And unfortunately, because it is has the biggest impact on yield of flour, and that's where all the value comes in for cannabis, it's causing a huge economic problem. I think um, it, the estimate is like $4 billion a year, and it can reduce basically your revenue by about 30%, which is a lot when we're talking about, especially the sort of on edge level that everybody is, or a lot of people are in the cannabis industry right now. So it's one of those issues that can be so expensive to ignore that it's it's not really an option for people to just not deal with it or think about how they can mitigate it because it's it's very, very expensive. And it seems like it's pretty overwhelming. It's not like this is a unique case or maybe it's a one-off. It seems like it's pretty overwhelming universally seen around the industry. And I guess I want to understand, is it something that you can see optically through your eyes when you're walking the facility, or is it more one that you have to test for in order to understand whether or not you have it? Yes. So it's a complicated answer because it's both. <laughs> so there are some symptoms and in certain cultivars, they're extremely prominent. So, you know, the stunting, you can see like the branches will come out more horizontally. You can see funny shaped leaves, sometimes um, chlorotic or miscolored leaves. Unfortunately, in some cultivars, the symptoms are incredibly subtle or non-existent. In some, you see nothing during veg and then they flower and you're like, oh, well, it just completely dot it out. So you have no warning. So the only way to be certain to really mitigate it and keep yourself safe is to test, get in some type of regular testing schedules so that you're always getting information and making sure that your garden is healthy. Can it still affect the plant if it's dormant? So it doesn't actually lie like dormant the way that people think about it, which like a volcano. Not like yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, latent is an unfortunate name, right? Because it, <laughs> it, it, latent does mean dormant in by role biology, but what they meant to say was asymptomatic for this one. So it's always going to be replicating for the most part in the plant, but there are some cultivars that it either replicates very slowly, it spreads very slowly, or that particular strain just doesn't care. So you can have cultivars that have a ton of viroid and have no symptoms and don't you don't even see a yield loss. So it's kind of all over the map and it's very specific to cultivar what you see. But it seems like from what you said, it's very critical to be proactive in your testing versus reactive, because if you assume that you don't have it and you're one of the 80 percent that do, you could end up with a dud yield, which could really sabotage kind of your cycles from, from an economic standpoint. Yes, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that generally comes in on new genetics. And if you aren't proactively testing and looking for it, it will spread silently throughout the entire garden. And the issue isn't necessarily just one harvest lost. It's that you're looking at all of your genetics, you know, some of them incredibly valuable that are now infected with this disease that doesn't really have a, a simple cure. And so there's, an, I mean, the best solution is to throw everything away, but that's obviously a huge economic hit. And so it's, 
better to just protect yourself from the beginning than to try to fight that battle after everything's been infected. Is there other agricultural industries that have been affected by it? I mean, I was going to say hops, but I don't know if that's too obvious. And if so, has there been solutions that they've kind of generated that the cannabis industry can look to at least to mitigate all this? Yes, absolutely. So for hop and viroids specifically, the only other crops besides cannabis that have natural infections, meaning that it wasn't, they weren't inoculated or infected in a lab. It happens naturally in nature are hops, like you mentioned, that that's where the name comes from. And um, stinging nettle, actually, which most no. people aren't cultivating massive amounts of. No. But, um, <laughs> um, not so yet. hops? Yeah. <laughs> like, you well, never know, right? <laughs> Could be a no, trend. That's not a fun plant to play with, <laughs> to be honest. I guess one of the issues, which is probably why this is so prevalent, is the majority of cultivars and hops are asymptomatic, which is why they called it hop latent thyroid in the first place. Um, and so they haven't really done a lot of mitigation in hops because it it, it, it just doesn't affect the crop nearly as much. In other systems, in other crops with other viroids, which a lot of their biology is incredibly similar, the best mitigation effort that is at least been widely deployed is testing and clean stock. And so that, you know, that worked really well to solve issues with, for example, potato spindle tuber viroid. And so it's, that's a model that we can definitely adapt to cannabis and, you know, help people get through it or avoid it if we can. So one of the benefits is Tumi has a solution that can help with this big problem. I'd love for you to get into that solution and then we can kind of dive into some of the detailed specifics of building the solution. Yes, absolutely. So the solution kind of a much bigger scale is what you mentioned is a proactive versus a reactive approach. And so the proactive approach involves kind of four major steps. And we call those, uh, we, we've created this really dorky acronym to help people understand it. It's called STOP. Um, and it just, they're mostly common sense things <laughs> that help people uh, limit entry and limit spread, you know, and it stands for sterilization, you know, a, a clean testing program, organizing your facility after you understand what you're up against, and then protecting it from entry of these things into your plants. That's kind of the big, the a big overview of it anyway. So how does the process work? I'm a cultivar. I may or may not have a problem. Maybe I'm one of the proactive ones looking to get ahead of this. I recall out to you and say, hey, I hear everyone's talking about this. What do I do? What do I need to know in order to prepare myself? Yes, absolutely. So the first and most important thing is to realize that in order to limit pathogen entry and spread into your facility, you need to take what we call a system-based approach, which means that instead of just saying, okay, I'm going to test my plants or, you know, I'm just not going to take in any new genetics. You look at your entire process from a systems approach and you identify critical control points or weaknesses within that process. And this whole concept even goes beyond top latent viroid because it, you know, there's fusarium, there's pythium, there's other things that could make you have a really bad day besides this particular pathogen. So we can help people go through their entire cultivation process. And then we identify those critical control points and we help them make small changes that fit into their uh, the efficiency in their workflow, but that will drastically reduce their probability of getting an infection or help them limit the spread. So obviously part of this is coming up with an intelligent surveillance or testing program for their plants. So what we do at Tumi Genomics is we help people build these programs and it used to involve TACMAN PCR, which we offer as an in-lab service. Well, you'll test your plants at specific time points and we help people organize something called a clean stock, which um, sort of helps separate your genetics from the rest of the cultivation process so we can make sure those stay safe. And um, we've also recently released an on-site testing platform and we've integrated that also into the testing program. So Growers can sort of capitalize on the strengths of both in-lab PCR as well as, you know, the convenience and the efficiency of an on-site testing. And so um, I can't go over the exact details because it kind of depends on the cultivation facility that we're working with. But basically, we can build a plan that protects people, um, gives them the information they need to understand what these pathogens are, how to recognize them and how to keep themselves safe. So essentially, you're providing a way to kind of compartmentalize every step 
through their cultivation process and then kind of putting gating features in between those steps to ensure that something contaminated doesn't get passed on to the next step. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, most of these things are, you know, in practice, incredibly simple. Like if you reuse your plastic pots, you need to sterilize those first because that's a step a lot of people skip. And that spreads pythium through their facility. Or when you're dipping your clones, you're not going to, you don't want to dip all of them in the same clonal gel because that becomes an inoculum for everything that any plant that was dipped in there had, you know, and then just testing at critical points where if you identify a positive plant at this point and pull it out, you're protecting the maximum number of plants downstream and the maximum amount of, of investment, which is really what we're talking about here is risk uh, aversion. Yeah. And how valuable has it been for individuals who have taken the on-site testing system and implemented it? I mean, it sounds like it's going to save a ton of time and like being that close to the information sounds crazy valuable. Yes, no, absolutely. So we we just deployed the system in February. So we don't have a ton of of like real in the facility data, but a lot of people, especially when right before you're cutting clones, they want to test their mother plants to make sure nothing is sick. So they're not like cutting an entire room full of fusarium or hop latent or whatever. But there's a huge waiting time for that, right? So sometimes it's like an entire week of waiting to find out which mothers they can cut. And so being able to do that in one day saves a massive amount of, of labor. It improves efficiency. And, you know, in some calculations, you know, with if you can eliminate all that waiting, you could add possibly even another harvest into the cycle. And so um, there's a lot of money to be saved by improving that efficiency. First off, congratulations, because understanding the development cycle that goes into that and then the optimization, the validation, the beta testing, the reoptimization, that is not a small feat. And I think for our listeners, I'd love for you to kind of give just why something like that takes so long. And it's not as simple as taking a tool from the lab and sending it off to the facility so that they can use it like there. Yes, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, I'll be honest, I I knew that the development was going to take a long time, but it took even longer than (laughs) than even I thought it was going to take. So when you're developing these type of technologies, there's two critical things you have to consider. One is, you know, obviously the technology has to work and you have to prove that it works. But two, you have to prove that not only can a scientist do it in a lab, but you could give it to, you know, a regular guy or gal, and they could do it as well. And oddly enough, it's so much easier to design a difficult, complex test for a scientist than it is to design something that's really, really easy. So those were our two biggest challenges. And as far as developing the science, it was incredibly important to us that not only did we make a good test, but we made a test that pushed the boundaries of what's possible. Because I feel like, you know, one of the reasons I really like the cannabis industry, working in the cannabis industry is because I feel like you guys have been kind of underserved scientifically and the bar hasn't quite been placed at a very high position. So it was really important for us to not just design something that worked, but design something that really worked and was just kind of the best on-site technology available like to general ag, you know, for that a regular person could do and bring that type of rigor into the cannabis industry. So we did more than a year of optimization, trying to improve the, you know, the limit of detection, the accuracy, you know, changing buffers and amounts and just a a big, big process. And then we released it into the wild to the beta testers. And that brought in a whole nother level of issues of ways that people could make mistakes that had never occurred to us. And so that we that took a whole nother and maybe nine months of taking all of that feedback, changing it, giving them a different version, changing it again. Um, and so it was a long haul and a big investment, but I think incredibly important because, you know, for I don't if we're going to release something into the cannabis industry, I want it to be great and I want it to be easy to use and I want it to be useful to growers. So that process just took a long time. <laughs> I have a a question about that process. Sure. So when you are kind of going through the optimization of technology for your everyday operator in the industry, Mm -hmm. right? How did you kind of handle some of the conversations where like 
say the operator wanted to get into the weeds associated with like PCR and some of the like high level details that you and your team spent, you know, your careers developing all this knowledge and information about and all this stuff. How do you feel like this conversation where it's a question that may require a PhD in molecular biology to answer? Like, how did you navigate some of those, those conversations? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So I guess what I find, and this kind of is in general, in my experience is teaching biology and helping people understand these concepts, is that the concepts themselves aren't necessarily that challenging. It's the vocabulary that people struggle with. Like once you start like, you know, throwing out like, you know, isothermal amplification and hybridization and everyone's like, whoa, what? But if you can sort of replace those words with things like common things that people understand, like, you know, your DNA is like a book in the library. It has an information. Each sentence is like sort of an analogous to an RNA molecule. Then people, it's easier for them to grasp. So basically my strategy is to just take a lot of those vocabulary words out, replace them with concepts that are similar that people understand in their day-to-day lives. And some drawings help too. So <laughs> But I, I actually really like teaching. So I think it's fun when growers want to know more about how all of this works. I, I really enjoy those conversations. It's such a really difficult, fine balance, right? To have this incredibly complex tool that does this incredible science and then being able to simplify this for an everyday person who can pick up the test and then to use it. Because if it's not used correctly, the results might not dictate what is needed in order to assure these people that they're taking the right steps. So how do you balance that kind of guarantee without doing the test for them that a these people are doing the test correctly in order to ensure that the results are valid given the parameters you've set forth for them. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, obviously, a huge part of them doing the test correctly is to remove the complexity. And so, you know, a lot of that is just taking steps that require scientific equipment like pipette or something, and then finding alternatives that some like somebody's like comfortable using, like something like like a squeezy bulb, like a like a turkey baster is is a movement that a regular person does. And so finding instruments and things that we can integrate into the test that are easy to use that don't require understanding like what a microliter is, that kind of thing. And then obviously just providing a lot of support. We do every time someone gets, especially this on-site testing thing, they get a a personalized um, onboarding, which is either a video call or we just go there in person and we show them how to use it. And a lot of it's trial and error, like doing, you know, we had six different facilities beta test. And so we got all sorts of questions and mistakes. And so it comes with a lot of information, hopefully simplified so that it's not difficult to read, that just kind of preemptively gives advice and helps people understand how to set things up. So let's let's go through some of those beta tests. I'm curious to know like some of those reactions, right? You're approaching these cultivars. They've got these issues. They're aware and they're interested in the test. Approaching them and letting them know that you've created this simple to use science tool. Some might be a little more hesitant and say, hey, like we got nobody here that can do that. Or others who might be more inclined to like jump right in. What percentage was was each? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, the majority of the people we approached to beta test were excited about it. We had a couple of people that started and then it, it was it was just that they were so busy. And like you said, maybe there wasn't somebody to run it or they had they lost a, a, an employee or whatever. And then there wasn't anybody to do it. But I mean, honestly, most of the people that we talked to were really excited about doing it. And um, it was it. that's one of my favorite things about the cannabis industry is because, you know, a lot of times customers will call and ask me a question and I'll be like, well, we don't know. Nobody knows. So how would you like to do an experiment with us and find out the answer? And so and usually they're like, yeah, which is so cool, you know, because that it, that is not true in every industry. <laughs> So it's actually really fun. It's a great place to do research because everybody's really excited about it. Were there times during the beta testing where you guys were working through some of these issues that, hey, they got a false positive, there was a panic, and then they they called you and you're like, hey, it could have been this. Like, how did those, some of those kind of uh, situations get worked out? 
Yeah. Yeah. So the way that we did it was it was kind of similar to the way that that tests are or the accuracy is checked with tests that go through the FDA. So everybody who did a beta test got the Tumi Glow, which is the on-site testing reactions, and they also got PCR tubes that matched exactly. So for every plant they tested, they tested both Tumi Glow and an in-lab PCR. And so we would say, Whatever the Tumi Glow says, don't panic. Don't do anything with it. I mean, you, if you got if you got a positive, you can put it to the side or something. But wait to do anything until you get that PCR result. Um, and that way, we were able to constantly monitor the accuracy and you know make corrections if things looked funny. So we were always getting a ton of information. And the people that beta tested for us were awesome because. That's a lot of work, right? Collecting a sample for one test and then another sample for a different test on the same plant. But everyone was really excited to do it. And and I'm I'm so grateful that there were so many cool people in the cannabis industry to kind of help us get this going. Yeah, one of the biggest challenges with the beta testing is kind of just establishing that trust with the instrument itself that the tool can deliver the value. So in that early on process of looking for beta testers, were you seeking out cultivars versus ones that had pain and saying, hey, we know you have this? Or were you approaching them saying, hey, you may have this. Here's a tool that could benefit you. Which which approach were you taking early on to establish that trust with the beta testers? Yeah, we were kind of in a cool position because we had been providing in-lab services to a lot of people for a, lo a long time. And so we kind of already knew, you know, which facilities may have some issues that they might be excited about trying something like this. And, 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 and we could, we could select people from all different sizes of grows and, and, you know, maybe one beta tester has a master's degree. Another one is, is, is just more like a, you know, regular person. Well, not, not that people with master's degree aren't regular people, but like all different levels of skills, I mean, um, which was incredibly useful for us. So we, we selected a, a wide range of different people, different types of facilities, different levels of hot plate and viroid to kind of get a feel across the board how it would be handled. And you guys had established that trust with these partners via just third party testing already, correct? Yes. Yeah. They were all previous customers of ours. So they all kind of knew us already. And, and you know, they were very understanding in the beginning because obviously you it works great in the lab and then you put it in a cultivation facility and all sorts of things go wrong that you hadn't realized would go wrong. And so we're like, okay, we'll be out there tomorrow with a different type of tube or a different type of capillary or whatever. So, but they were really, really cool about, you know, just trying new things and, and helping us out. So it was, it was a really cool experience. For the cultivars that don't use this type of testing, is it cash challenge or is it that internally they're not the proactive approach where they more reactive and hey, like if we got this problem, we'll deal with this, but we haven't dealt with it prior. How, how do you, how does that work amongst the industry? Yeah. So it's kind of all over the map. I mean, I, I definitely think the cost is an issue, right? Because, you know, the cannabis industry is kind of in a precarious position at the moment. And a lot of people don't have extra cash for testing. Some of it is more of a planning kind of issue. Like, if you look at how like general ag works, especially especially in the nursery industry, testing, preventative testing is just kind of a line item in the budget. And so it's just something you do. It's just part of the process. But because cannabis is kind of a, there's sort of a wild west, sort of everybody's doing their own thing. Um, it doesn't always make it into the budget. And so sometimes it's just like, a, well, we, we've never done this before. So why would we do this now sort of thing? Yeah. I mean, the best, the best way, of course, to do it is when you're setting up to realize, hey, I need to do pathogen testing as part of my budget for my new facility. So I'm just going to write it into the budget and then it just becomes part of the process. But a lot of, you know, a lot of people didn't start like that. So they, they're kind of like dialing back into it and there's some challenges there. Are there any possibilities if they do have this virus on their, their plants? I know you said throw them all away, which nobody ever wants to hear, but is there any sort of possibilities, anything that your team is thinking about or working on in order to mitigate this or reduce kind of the impact on it from a plant standpoint? Okay, so obviously tissue culture is an option. We don't do tissue culture at our facility, but that does work. Not 100%, and it's better with some cultivars than others. And there, there's a lot of details there, and it, it can be a really long process. There are other 
possibilities of ways that this could be treated or that you can develop targeted treatments. Um, and it actually involves targeting the letters, the specific letters in the information of the viroid. And there is evidence in the literature that this works. And we would love to have the opportunity to kind of develop that. It's kind of a longer term plan of ours. So we don't have anything going yet. But I do think there's a possibility for treatment or identifying what makes some cultivars resistant and possibly engineering that into your favorite cultivar so that it just doesn't really catch it very easily. What about a, a vaccine, right? Like maybe an mRNA vaccine, that maybe like a retrovirus kind of situation for a plant. Yeah. I know, I don't know if like, I'm not versed on vaccines for plants, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, yeah. I'm going to cancel you, Kevin. <laughs> it's like... Uh, it's coming out of left field, but that's <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, so, so kind of what you're suggesting is similar to the idea of targeting the sequence. So yeah. plants don't have like an adaptive immune system, like mammals where they make antibodies and all oh, that. Boy. So, but what you can do is, so instead of having that adaptive immune system, plants do something called RNAi, which is very similar to what it, it's not, it, it's not exactly the same, but it's, the, it follows the same concept. So the idea would be to trigger that portion of the plant's immune system ahead of time so that it's kind of primed when it reaches, when it's um, exposed to the viroid, um, it already has the tools to fight it off or, you know, even giving it that, that those tools right when it's infected and then it, it can, can kind of fight it off. So those are, those are two options, very similar to what you're, you're suggesting a little different than vaccines, but same idea. Different, different words, right? It's that whole yes. word thing. Exactly. It's a vocabulary thing. But. So if I recall correctly, you said about 2018, uh, hops latent viroid kind of was really prevalent amongst the industry. Are there any other pathogens, viruses that you foresee upcoming that other industries have kind of seen before that you think the cannabis industry needs to start looking out for? Yes. Um, so currently, so first, right now, because I think there's not a ton of awareness the two other pathogens that I think don't get enough press but are incredibly important are Fusarium and Pythium. So especially if you're an indoor grower, I call those three the three horsemen of the cannabis apocalypse. So you you want to protect yourself from those because um, they can be very devastating. Uh, Fusarium and Pythium are root molds or fungus. So they're a totally different type of pathogen, but just as damaging as hop latent. As far as other pathogens, there are quite a few that are that can infect outdoor grows more specifically than indoor, like beet curly top, lettuce chlorosis, uh, tobacco streak virus is out there, alfalfa mosaic. All of these are something that you would need to think about if you have an outdoor facility. Indoor, much less common. That being said, Hop latent viroid is not the only viroid that infects hops. It's definitely not the most damaging. So there are other viroids like hop stunt viroid, apple fruit crinkle, crackling bark viroid. And all of these have the potential to um, be able to replicate using uh, cannabis biology. And so nobody's identified them yet. I know people have been looking, but it's... Um, it's a possibility that those will also end up jumping into cannabis. And that's why it's so important to have a proactive plan in place. It's not just for what's happening now. It's for what's going to happen. Um, and if you have that plan in place, you can keep yourself safe even from, you know, mystery threat. Do you see viruses affecting indoor grows more than outdoor grows? Or is it kind of the same across the, the board? Yeah. So for hop latent viroid, it's Pretty similar. I would say, yeah, no, I don't really see a huge difference between indoor and outdoor, except for outdoor, because you can just plant more plants. That's cheaper on an outdoor basis. Um, maybe the concern isn't as high as for the indoor. As far as other viruses, a, a large number of those are transferred by insects, and some of them are geography specific, like beet, the beet curly top is transferred by beet leafhopper, which is much more common, um, like in the Western United States. So um, you know, if you don't have a beet leaf hopper in your in in your in the inside of your facility or you're in Michigan or something, it's it's going to be incredibly rare. So for those viruses, outdoor um, way more common than indoor. So before we talked about, you said that some of the facilities don't have testing as like a line item on there, which is 
alarming now, but probably more common than we want to believe. Is there yeah. a certain percentage that they should allocate towards uh, testing overall for their their total plants? Is it like a, a, a numerical value that you see you, for every plant you should have a test? Is there any sort of calculation like that, or is it more just kind of what you're comfortable with? Yeah. So um, the one thing I've heard, actually, this was from uh, Travis, who just established the due diligence horticulture consulting um, is that it's you'd want to budget about 2% for IPM, and that includes testing. The way that I encourage growers to think about this is think about the value of a mother plant. Now, not just that plant, but everything that will come from that plant. Like how many clones do you cut total from that mother plant? And then how many pounds of flour does that end up making you? You know, if it's $10,000, then think, okay, would I pay... $25 to ensure $10,000. Um, and when you think about it like that, it's like, you know, obviously, why why wouldn't you? Because that's so much money on the line that you could lose. And you can, you can basically buy the insurance for it ahead of time. And that's kind of how testing works. You're buying insurance, that you're increasing your chances of that harvest being successful and you, you're making the money you wanted to make from it. So powerful. And hearing the way you describe that, right? Would you spend twenty five dollars to guarantee... 10,000. It, it's hard. And most people would assume 99% would say absolutely. Yes. Right. But they, I think what well, they don't at the time, if they're the thinking isn't like that, it's like, oh man, I have to spend $2,000 on testing all my mothers. And that's a huge amount of money, but you just have to think of it in terms of what you could lose. If just imagine 80% of the facilities have this problem. So it, it's not like you can close your eyes and say, it's not going to happen to me because it's probably going to happen to everybody. <laughs> And better to just prevent it than suffer the loss in the end. And if there's an organization that's looking to implement testing, they don't have to go from zero to the full suite where they have it on site, right? They can slowly call you guys and start just dipping their toes and seeing how bad the issue is and then kind of coming up with a plan with your guys' help, correct? Yes, absolutely. And that's that's actually how we recommend people do it. We usually have them start with what we call a baseline. So they test a small percentage of their plants and we determine, you know, what is the pathogen pressure in this facility? And then we work with their budget, whatever that is, to implement the smartest program we can with, his, with, with the amount of money they're able to spend. And that doesn't always involve a ton of testing, you know, and, and we don't want people to not test, but we also don't want them to be feeling they have to test every single plant in their facility once a week because that's like insane, right? So we want the right amount of testing for their situation. So yeah, that's exactly how we go about it with, with people. If there was a certain message you could send out to cultivars, just like as a collective about the process, what, what would you tell them about just the overall approach? So I guess the most important thing to remember is that, you know, you, you hear a lot about hot plate and viroid, it's super expensive, it's scary, and, and there's a lot of fear. And I think the most important message is that there is a way to mitigate this and there's no reason to be afraid. It's just gathering information, creating a logical system to um, stop the spread or the entry of it, um, and then instigating that system, following those programs. And um, instead of being afraid, you just have a plan and um, you can protect yourself. And part of that plan is being proactive in your approach versus being reactive. Because again, like as you said, the solution that you suggested was throwing everything out, which I guess 99% of people would not want to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there is a way to avoid having to, you know, face that situation. And it's like you said, being proactive, preventing it instead of dealing with it once it's inside your facility. So say I, I'm, a, I, I'm a grower, I have an indoor crop coming down, I test it, it's got hop latent viroid, but I need the cash to continue running my business. Yep. Is there ways to kind of isolate that flower room, even though I know it's going to yield lower, but it is going to provide some sort of product to generate revenue? Is there some sort of situations like that where you've kind of been brought in and helped these cultivars, uh, growers kind of navigate that kind of a situation? Yes. In fact, that's the most common situation because most people aren't like, oh, I can just shut down for six months. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's not usually no, an option. Go to Mexico, so, right? Right. <laughs> I'll hire John. He'll come in, clean it all up. Right? There it is. 
so usually what we do when we design these programs is we help them figure out a way to create their clean stock in the background of their normal cultivation process. And so that involves still using the plants that are infected because that's that's the plants you have and those are the plants that are growing. But then what you do is you sort through your mother plants and look for clean stock and you kind of build up that genetic library in the background. And once you've found your clean stock for a certain um, cultivar, then you start integrating that into your process. And so it's a slow thing. It happens over time. Sometimes it can take up to six months, but then you're not really losing the efficiency. You're just doing something extra in the background. I was thinking from a consumer standpoint, is it still safe to consume products that have hoblate and viroid? And then if so, can consumer tell that the plant might have this? Yes. So it's first um, hoplite and viroid and viroids in general do not infect mammals. The, the, the biology is very specific to land plants. So it's not dangerous to it, ingest it. It's, it's just like genetic material that would be like a tomato or you know, in anything else that you eat or smoke or whatever, like tobacco, you can tell. So I've definitely, we've gotten a pre-roll and I'm like, oh, but this was infected mostly because it, it, it doesn't do anything. Like the THC content is so low or, you know, it's the, the bud is super fluffy and, and underwhelming that that's a telltale sign of hot plane by right. If you could put anything on a billboard, metaphorically speaking, to get a message to billions of people, it could be an image, a quote, a word, or something that inspired you. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, wow. <laughs> you mean just for me in general or for Correct. the culture? Man, I guess never give up. That's what I had to keep telling myself in this whole startup journey, because that's, you, you got to keep saying that. <laughs> what question do you wish more people asked you? You know, in in as far as cultivation is concerned, I think I would love to be asked ahead of time, how do I organize my facility to address pathogens proactively? How, what 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 do I do before I've even opened the building? And explain to me the biology of haplotype and virus. Like, what do I need to know in order to prevent it or mitigate it from moving around? Dream smoking session: three people, dead or alive. Wow. Okay. Um. Okay, my grandmother, <laughs> that one would be fun. <laughs> I guess Albert Einstein and um, my first scientific mentor. His name uh, was Tom Blumenthal. I think it would be fun to uh, share a joint with him for sure. <laughs> what is the most expensive lesson you've ever learned? Ooh, the most expensive lesson. Plan ahead. Or maybe as some of my professors used to put it, it's the same concept, but um, two weeks in the library can save you two years at the bench. So, you know, planning before you jump in and try to do something. Like that, one. that was a tough one. <laughs> All right. Prediction time. Dr. Tassa, in the next five years, how do you anticipate advancements in cannabis genomics will revolutionize cultivar development and crop protection strategies? Yes. So I am hoping that in the next five years, at least from a pathogen standpoint, we understand what genes contribute to resistance uh, against pathogens. And we're able to introduce those genes into cultivars to help them basically be immune to a lot of these problems. Also, obviously, just understanding the cannabis genome in general. And I hope that that understanding will lead to preservation of some of the variety of uh, different cultivars, because I, I I always have this nagging fear that everyone's so fixated on THC and and certain attributes that we're losing all of these really exciting chemicals that have all these medicinal um, applications. So, um, but that's that's my hopeful wish for the next five years is that <laughs> that becomes a priority. Love it, Kellen. Uh, I think that there's going to be a hybridization within the cannabis plant that's going to merge traits from fiber hemp into kind of flower cannabis, if you will, right? And so you're going to see cultivars that have the characteristics associated with fiber hemp, meaning it grows 16 feet high. Um, it can be utilized to create textiles and, and other building materials, but it's also going to bud, which then creates the flowers that contain the medicinal compounds that Tasso was just mentioning. And so I think that you're going to see 
crops like that kind of become more prevalent because it'll let organizations diversify their revenue instantly from a crop perspective, right? That's my guess. What do you think, Brian? I think it's just an overall fundamental switch from being reactive to proactive. Maybe now the balance is 50-50, but I think over time, people will continue to get hit with other pathogens that might pop up and cause this massive disruption. And at a certain point, you just don't want to have to be on the receiving end of a, a massive disruption. So I think a fundamental switch of enough people kind of getting hammered with the problem might switch the industry's overall message to be more of a proactive approach versus reactive, which I think will do a lot of business as well. And I understand the challenges from a cash standpoint of having to prioritize certain things. But at the end of the day, exactly like you said, $25, $10,000, would you? Everyone would say yes. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Tassa, for those who have Hoplite and Viroid that are interested in the testing, where can they find you? Yes. So we have a website, uh, timigenomics.com. We are on LinkedIn, Instagram. You can shoot us an email, send us a message on Instagram, LinkedIn, contact us through the website. We have a chat function there. You know, my email is tatha at timigenomics.com. You're welcome to just shoot me straight an email. I'm happy to help set up a testing program or lots of times I just answer questions about hoplite and viroid and sterilization. And I don't mind that at all. So yeah, feel free to contact us in any one of those forums and we can help you out. Thanks for taking the time. This was a lot of fun. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. I had a great time.